Uh, I believe you are here for Corinne. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Corinne today for her defense. Um, uh, we always need to say something about our student who's defending. And uh, there are many things I really want to say about Corinne. But I realize it's one thing I can actually use uh, her own word to describe it. So uh, I recently learned that she has coined this uh, new term called uh, linear. It spells as L-I-N-I-O-N. <laughs> so clearly I have a whole bunch of them I just never knew. <laughs> so Corinne is one of those that has now in this uh, group and the biggest, uh, I would say, one of the biggest um, uh, features or characteristics of uh, linians is they grow a lot. Um, in fact, um, I believe this is from, let's say, um, Lion King, right? And it's one of my family's favorite movies, indeed. And if you think about how much Simpa grew from the beginning of that movie to the end, it's almost uh, not recognizable, right? And um, I think that I actually got confirmed today by Corinne's dad, who just told me that um, he always uh, wanted Corinne to be nice uh, and also really like a, a good citizen, right? <laughs> but it turns out that she has been a lot more than that. So it's this growth that is really amazing in these past several years. So Corinne has chosen a really challenging but also amazing project to pursue in the past uh, six years. And today you're going to hear all these different things that she has done. And it's even better, Corinne is a great storyteller. <laughs> so don't worry, you will not be lost. So with that, I'm going to have Corinne take the stage. Before we start, I just want to check that Professor Forney is with us. Professor Forney, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So, good morning. My name is Corinne Jackman, and today I will be discussing the work that I've done for my dissertation, which uses a microfluidic co-cultivation technology platform to further elucidate and investigate bacterial interactions that are specifically from the human vaginal microbiome. There are approximately 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in your body. The Human Microbiome Project set forth to understand the relationship between microbial composition and human health risks. In their study, they had over 200 people participate and donate body samples that were over 18 different sites. For example, one of the sites was the nasal passage, the oral cavity, skin, the gastrointestinal tract commonly referred to as the gut, and also the urogenital tract, which for this purpose we will refer to as the vaginal microbiome. In 2011, there was a study that used independent sequencing in order to determine the most dominant bacterial species that dominated um, each woman of reproductive age. Each of the points in this tetrahedron represents the most dominant bacteria. There are five different vertices that are shown by this tetrahedron. The four lactobacillus species are Lactobacillus crispatus, Lactobacillus gasseri, Lactobacillus inners, and Lactobacillus gensenii. Lactobacillus are lactic acid producing bacteria and most of which are associated with promoting health. However, there is a fifth group. This fifth group is known as the diversity group and is composed of bacteria such as Gardnerella vaginalis, Mobiluncus, Antipobium, and many more. People who are dominated by diversity group, for example in this tetrahedron, are considered to be healthy. 
But what is interesting is that the diversity group, or the bacteria in the diversity group, are actually associated with bacterial vaginosis. <clears throat> what happens is, when there is an increase of bacteria that are associated with the diversity group, sometimes there can be an imbalance. And sometimes, the number of bacteria from the diversity group increase so much and such that the lactobacillus species decreases. When this happens, there can be imbalance which can lead to dysbiosis. One example of dysbiosis is bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis, or BV, is a polymicrobial syndrome, and it happens to be the leading cause of women's health care visits in the United States of women of reproductive age. What happens is when women have bacterial vaginosis, they have an increased chance of acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted infections such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and when these are untreated, they can progress into pelvic inflammatory disease, which can lead to infertility in women. One question that you may be asking is, if all of the women are happen to be healthy in this study, but there's quite a few of them who are dominated or have high prevalences of diverse bacteria that are associated with BV. How can these women still be healthy and, be and mostly be colonized by <coughs> species from the diversity group? And how do the different bacteria interact with each other over time? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and this is a question that we have had. And in order to help understand uh, these interactions, we have employed a a microfluidic co-cultivation technology platform. In simpler words, these are basically micro droplets that are being generated using a microfluidic device. Uh, the device that we're using is held by the geometry is a flow focusing uh, geometry, which we will talk about later. Each of these micro droplets are about the, the size of the circumference of a strand of hair. And they are on the nanoliter to picoliter scale. Each of the micro droplets can be used or referred to as a miniature bioreactor. And one of the advan advantages to using micro droplets is that it enables a more high throughput experimentation. And also because they are so small, they have wonderful confining properties that allows us to confine small microbial subsets and take advantage of any kinds of like small amounts of fluid. So in our case, vaginal fluid. So now that we've been introduced to micro droplets, I'd like to talk more about how we can actually use them to cultivate bacteria. So first we have three different micro droplets with different kinds of cells. The different cells are represented by the shapes and the different colors. This is called encapsulation or confinement. And then we cultivate them. The conditions for cultivation are dependent on the species that you would like to cultivate. Um, for our work, we use the anaerobic conditions because the vagina is known to be a hypoxic environment, which means limited oxygen. So as you can see, there are there is one micro droplet that did have growth, and this would we would call this cultivation. And there are two droplets that did not. Now after this, you have you can use all of the micro droplets, or you can isolate a single micro droplet and have some kind of analysis where you can use something like quantitative polymerase chain reaction, qPCR, or you can enumerate the cells onto agar medium, or you can do 16S rRNA gene sequencing, uh, whichever you choose, or if they're fluorescent, you can do um, fast fluorescent automated screen, screening, cell screening, or sorting. So um, now that we have learned how to encapsulate and characterize these cells, I'd like to let you know that there are a lot of different interactions that can be observed using micro droplets. For instance, you can see mutualism. Mutualism is when two different species are unable to grow on their own, as shown here. So these show, and, and then they are able to grow when they're in, in co-culture. So we see this cell, this is a red rectangle and this blue circle. They're both different types of species. And when they grow on their own, called singleton droplets, they're not able to grow. However, when they are together, they are able to grow. This is called mutualism and was demonstrated by someone in our lab called um, Park, Ji Hung Park. And she published the study in 2011. And here we can see two different E. coli oxytropes in a single micro droplet, which are shown here. One is labeled with YFP and another with M. cherry. They are fluorescent. And when they are co-cultured, you see that they grew after 18 hours. 
However, when you have a singleton droplet with each of them, we see that there was no growth after 18 hours, and this demonstrates mutualism. There is another type of interaction known as immensalism. Immensalism is when both species, as shown here, are able to grow on their own. However, when they are co-cultivated, we see that only one species is able to grow. This is because one of the species has an inhibiting or killing effect on the other. We do base to um, molecules that are produced and inhibit the other. But you have another type of interaction called competition. And I think of this as resource competition, where both species are able to grow on their own, but when they are co-cultivated, one is able to get to the nutrients before the other or faster than the other, and you can see that one outcompetes the other and has higher fitness in the environment. Now that we have learned about the different interactions that can be observed and detected in micro droplets, I'd like to share with you the different aims and platforms that we have used in order to further elucidate uh, microbial interactions in the vaginal microbiome using a microfluidic platform. First, it's important to show that micro droplets can indeed be used to understand and investigate interactions. And so we have extended a pipe technological pipeline in order to recapitulate uh, an interaction that was already reported. Secondly, we wanted to investigate some of the pairwise interactions between lactobacillus species, most of which are associated with promoting health in the vagina. And we did this using standardized and synthetic laboratory media, which is commonly used to cultivate lactobacillus species. And third, we understand that people act differently in different environments, and the same can be understood for bacteria. Bacteria behave differently depending on their environment. And if we use more of a natural simulated milieu or a vaginal environment, like a vaginal fluid, we want to eventually culture the bacteria and also um, further, further work, study interactions between them. And so with these three different aims, uh, we would like to um, develop and demonstrate the high throughput nature that micro droplets have in order to elucidate some of these interactions in the human vaginal microbiome. And also exploit the confining properties of micro droplets to show how we can work with small volumes. And eventually this technique can also be used for many other ecosystems, not just the human vaginal microbiome. Aim one. So this work was basically inspired or as part of it was a report that we looked at was from Atasi in 2006, where she was able to show, he or she was able to show <coughs> lactobacillus gasteri cells and lactobacillus gasteri byproducts and their effect on Gardnerella vaginalis. The y-axis shows the colony forming units of Gardnerella vaginalis and the x-axis is time. And we can see that when the cells are in co-culture with Gardnerella vaginalis, they are able to survive. But when we mix the byproduct of Gardnerella vaginalis, within one hour, uh, viability has dropped by about seven log. And this would show um, a killing effect that this specific species, Lactobacillus gasseri, has on Gardnerella vaginalis. Some of these mechanisms for exclusion um, are considered to be lactic lactic acid, uh, which is produced by the lactobacillus species. And there are other mechanisms as well, putative uh, mechanisms. But because we were able to see how lactobacillus and its ability to produce lactic acid indeed does inhibit the ability for Gardnerella vaginalis to grow, um, we wanted to further demonstrate this, use this platform and demonstrate it using micro droplets. And then in a second pair, we wanted to further demonstrate it using another species. And it's important to note that the species we chose is Gardnerella vaginalis, which has been associated with bacterial vaginosis, and another bacterium that has been associated with aerobic vaginosis, a less publicized uh, but polymicrobial syndrome. So the first step in order to apply our approach or develop our approach was to first choose our model system, which we did, Flacbacillus genseniae and Gardnerella. And then we confined the micro droplets as you can see here, we have two droplets in the micro droplet as they're being generated, then we have three, and in some cases we have four. This happens in real life, and it's because of what is called the Poisson distribution, which has a, a range of different number of particles or cells per droplet. Then after we have encapsulated the bacteria, then we cultivate them. Um, as you can see, uh, 
the monoculture here, um, the, the first and the last micro droplet have grown. Uh, but we see that there's some kind of an interaction here, and if you remember, that was this demonstration is just you know, one of those interactions, the mentalism. And then there were two different ways that we, two different assays that we had in order to analyze um, the cell content. And our main goal here was to enumerate or compare the growth when a species was in co-culture with the other, and compare the growth when it was in monoculture by itself. So the first assay was by pooling uh, micro droplets and using quantitative polymerase chain reaction, qPCR. So what we did was we pooled the droplets together and then destabilized them and used this technique, uh, which does not involve cell viability but only the DNA content. And then we used a spacing device in order to isolate single micro droplets, destabilize each of those single micro droplets, and enumerate the colony forming units from each of the micro droplets in order to compare and con um, compare and contrast the number of cells in monoculture and co-culture. So these results are from a flask culture. Before actually doing the micro droplet experiment, we wanted to show that we can show similar interaction in, in flasks. So on the left hand side is Garnerella vaginellus, and on the y axis is the full change of colony forming units. And the, the the black bar represents Gardnerella in monoculture by itself, and then Gardnerella is in co-culture with Elgin sunii. The four asterisks here represent a significant difference between Gardnerella and Vaginellus, such that Gardnerella is inhibited by Lactobacillus gensenii. In the case for Lactobacillus gensenii, we see that there is NS, which is no significance um, between the two different uh, conditions. And so we say that using a flask culture, uh, we saw that Gardnerella vaginalis was inhibited in cold culture, but Lactobacillus gensenii was not. So now we are moving into the microfluidic aspect of the project, of this aim. So first I'd like to show you the actual device that we use. The device can be held in the palm of your hand, and it's comparable to that, the size of a penny, as you can see. Mm. And uh, the actual material is made from PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane. And it, we, it's commonly used because of its advantageous properties, which include being chemically inert, being non-toxic, being readily producible, and optically clear. And when the micro droplets are generated, we have the media, which includes the bacteria. And that is diluted to whatever dilution you would like in order to have a certain lambda or number of cell, average number of cells per droplet. And then we have oil that comes in, and as they shear together, flow through the orifice, they generate confined um, and monodispersed micro droplets. So afterward, in panels C through H, we can see six different micro droplets. On the left hand side is are the micro droplets at time zero, and on the right hand side are the micro droplets at time 12. And what you can see is that there are more cells after 12 hours than there are at zero, which would indicate growth. And you can also see that these cells are more rod-shaped and they tend to agglomerate for panel C and D, um, which panel C is lactobacillus gensenii. Um, when it grows, as you can see in panel D, it tends to just have more of the same. And you can see that this kind of is comparable to that. And when you look at to that meaning panel F, which is in cold culture, and when you look at a panel G, this is Gardnerella vaginellus. They're very, very small cells. They're coccus or circular shaped. And when they grow, these cells are planktonic. Now, qualitatively, when looking at the micro droplets, you may be able to see that Lactobacillus genii is going to grow and basically take up most of the space in the micro droplet. Um, and this would indicate that Lactobacillus gensenii would have an inhibiting effect on Gardnerella vaginellus. Now before going into the results from spacing, I'd like to show you the, what we use. So this was developed by Stephen, and you can, as you can see looking at the inside of the, micro, of the microfluid device, you can see that when we release pressure from this quick valve, droplets flow from the micro channel. And you might have just seen that two of them actually escaped at that point, but really the goal is to have one micro droplet escape at a time. And also, the device that we use is set up here where the micro droplets flow through this tube and go into a, a micro centrifuge tube. And to make sure that we are actually isolating single droplet, uh, we did some assays. And we used fluorescein micro droplets in order so that we can visually see them. And 
we kept working with them developing and optimizing the system so that instead of collecting four micro droplets, which are seen here, we can eventually have a higher probability of isolating one micro droplet. Um, this is one micro droplet in a micro well, and this, what you see here is a reflection, and that's also a reflection. So now we're looking at the results from pooling the micro droplets and doing qPCR, um, conducting qPCR on the pooled droplets on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have the estimated number of cells. They are estimated because we are working with the DNA content and correlating this number back to the number of cells based on a standard curve that's not shown here. And we have Gardnerella vaginalis here, and the black bar is in monoculture, and the white bar is in co-culture. And as you can see, Gardnerella vaginalis has grown more when it is in monoculture than in co-culture. When looking at Lactobacillus genthenia, there are two asterisks here, which was different from the FLASC results. But we must remember um, that qPCR is different from that in FLASC, and I will explain why. Lactobacillus genthenii in monoculture um, has grown more, but we see that there was a, there was a difference between monoculture and full culture. And we say this for, we see this, and we've repeated it over and over, we've seen the same result over and over with these experiments. And the reason why we think this happens is that we see this interaction in both cases with Gardnerella and with L. Jensenia is for a few reasons, and that is because we are using qPCR, which does not rely on viability of cells, only on DNA content after growth. And also because we are pooling micro droplets. When micro droplets grow, as you remember, like the Poisson distribution changes the number of cells that are initially in the droplet. But when we combine a thousand micro droplets, as we did in this case, approximately a thousand, we increase the signal to noise ratio. And in that way, we're able to cancel out any noise. And also, we just know that qPCR is a very highly sensitive technique. In the case of uh, enumerating the cells from individual micro droplets. On the y axis, we see the colony forming units per micro droplet. And then we see Gardnerella vaginalis on the left. The blue circles indicate the number of colony forming units that were detected from each micro droplet. And there were 10 micro droplets for each condition. As you can see, there is quite a bit of variation, but the cells are present. We have one all the way up to the order of magnitude of 1,000. And when we counted the colonies that were for Gardnerella vaginalis in co-culture, it's important to note that the same micro droplets that were enumerated, that were counted in the process, were analyzed for co-culture. We split the contents in half, such that the number of colonies that were present here were, this, were the colonies from, were the cells from the same micro droplet that was for Lactobacillus gensenii in co-culture. So as you see, Lactobacillus gensenii in co-culture had quite a few colony forming units that um, came from the micro droplets, but they're, all of the cells, this indicates all of the cells were dead um, in Gardnerella vaginalis, or did not grow on the colonies, on the agar medium. So this would suggest uh, that there was an inhibiting effect. However, because we have such a large range here of colony forming units using individual micro droplets, um, this took away, this was unable to give us any significance in terms of these results. And the reason might be because Gardnerella vaginalis is known to be a fastidious bacterium. And also, looking at the phenotypic differences between each cell, there are differences, just like there's differences in each of us, but we're all of the same species. Um, there's also differences between each cell. And also, the Poisson distribution, meaning that there are differences in the inherent differences in the number of cells that are initially um, in, cell, in colonies, in droplets. And for Lactobacillus gensenii, uh, we did not detect a difference uh, for either condition. So in order to further demonstrate the general applicability of our system, we have employed a second model system, which works with Lactobacillus, which includes Lactobacillus gensenii and Enterococcus fecalis. Enterococcus fecalis is associated with many, many infections in hospitals and has quite a few um, virulence factors and is associated with aerobic vaginitis, along with other species, but we have chosen Enterococcus. It is also much more robust than Gardnerella vaginalis and grows, and grows very well. Um, there was a study that was conducted in 1996 uh, where the adherence of Enterococcus fecalis was shown to decrease when it was um, with Lactobacillus retri, and when it was not, it was able to adhere um, better. So first, we 
we conducted a flask experiment. And on the, on the, in the y-axis, we show the full change of colony forming units. And on the x-axis, we see Enterococcus faecalis. And right away, you see a big difference between monoculture and co-culture. And that black bacillus ginsenii, um, when it was in co-culture, it inhibited the growth of Enterococcus. Um, but we did not see a difference for L. ginsenii. This would show a mentalism. And then, with, in terms of micro droplets, uh, we can see that the colonies, the micro droplets, were able to support the growth of the species. So when you see Lactobacillus ginsenii and you see um, the cells that are inside the micro droplet, you can see how much they've grown. We've also grown them in a different media and because we're growing different species. So it was MRS media, which is ideal for Lactobacillus species. Um, so Lactobacillus ginsenii has has a formed, um, has agglomerated and a more rod shaped. And this thing in morphology and growth uh, seems to be present in this microchocolate. However, Enterococcus faecalis is different. Its morphology is more um, heterogeneous, and we can see that they don't tend to clump in microchocolates as much. And so, qualitatively, this would indicate that a Lactobacillus ginsenii was inhibiting Enterococcus faecalis. So using a, our um, platform where we, or assay, when we isolated micro droplets, we were in fact able to indicate that Lactobacillus ginsenii did inhibit Enterococcus uh, to some level of significance. So here we see much less variation, but we do see Enterococcus was able to grow in micro droplets, and we see that Enterococcus in co-culture was able to grow, but there were differences, and this was statistically significant. When looking at Lactobacillus ginsenii from each of the individual micro droplets, there was no um, significant result that was seen between significant difference between the two different conditions. And so, in summary, we have demonstrated that Lactobacillus ginsenii indeed has inhibited Gardnerella vaginalis um, when flask culture, and then also with using qPCR. And then we were able to detect a mentalism in our second model system using our individual droplet platform. So now that we have demonstrated that micro droplets can be used in order to demonstrate different interactions in micro droplets in between bacteria, we wanted to investigate potential interactions between lactobacillus species using synthetic laboratory media. There are four different lactobacillus species, um, but two of them happen to be the most dominant species in the vascular microbiome. They are Lactobacillus crispatus, which is shown in red and is associated with health, and Lactobacillus inners, which is shown in orange. And it's debatable whether it is associated with health, but it has been, there are some characteristics that have associated it with possibly being a pathogen or possibly being a commensal organism. And so this graph represents the temporal fluctuations of Lactobacillus crispatus and Lactobacillus inners. And if you look closely, there are some other bacteria that were present. But subject 28, which was the healthy woman of reproductive age in the study, um, did, was mostly colonized by L. crispatus, but it changed every six weeks and, and, and so on as as time went on. And this type of study is called a longitudinal study. Uh, also, the y-axis is the type of bacteria, the number, the relative abundance of each of the species. And so when looking at Lactobacillus inners and Lactobacillus crispatus, uh, there was work done in 2016 by a person named, with the last name France. And what they did was they predicted and they compared the accessory genes, which are genes that are specific for that species, or that strain, and then they compared the core genomes of both of them. And so what we found is that, well, when looking at this pathway, we can see that the black arrow represents shared genes or shared pathway between Lactobacillus inners and Lactobacillus crispatus. So for example, both species are able to metabolize or uptake glucose, and then both species are able to produce L-lactate. But in the case of the other, the other D-lactate, only l crispatus is able to produce this. There are also other nutrients too. So both species are able to produce, to uptake maltose. However, fructose, which is, can also be found in the vagina. So it seems like there may be some kind of a parent of fundamental niche overlap where 
they are able to metabolize similar species, similar resources. So we wanted to investigate that empirically. So before showing results, I wanted to more in depth show um, show the differences or show the changing microbial composition that can occur within a woman. This graph, this chart represents one subject and how her microbiome, her vaginal microbiome changes over time. We start off like, with a diverse group and over time it moves to the lactobacillus crispatus and then it moves closer to lactobacillus innards microbiome. And then it starts to return back to lactobacillus crispatus. And then after about week 11 or 12, we see that it has went back to a diverse microbiota or microbial composition. So this graph looks pretty cool, but how is it that this happens? We don't really understand. We don't really know, per se, what, what causes these changes or what are the mechanisms by which these changes come about. However, we can say that there, there is a mechanism that has been predicted, and it's called condi conditional differentiation, which occurs when there happens to be, which can occur, when ha there happens to be resource competition. And so conditional differentiation is when the availability of a certain factor, whether it's abiotic or biotic, is present. And when it is present or not present, it will affect the fitness and competitive ability of that species. So some of the carbon sources uh, that can be shared is are glucose and maltose, but there are others that are shown that cannot be shared between both species. Carbon sources are very important for these bacteria. Also, iron. Uh, the host, when I say host, I mean human. Um, the host has a tight restriction on iron. And this could be because iron is known to increase uh, the ability for pathogens to grow because pathogens tend to need iron in order to grow. Um, however, we know that when the time of the month comes, there is iron that is available. Lactobacillus crispatus has been sequenced, and what we have seen is that they have ADC transporters, of which includes sideriforms that can actually acquire iron. Lactobacillus enters has also been shown to thrive in some cases when um, a serum that contains iron or when some types of blood have been added to media where they previously were not able to grow. And so what we wanted to do was to investigate whether or, whether or not the presence of resource competition or interference competition could be detected using synthetic laboratory media. So with resource competition, you have two different species, and they're competing for this, in this case, the simplified schematic. They're both competing for the same molecule of glucose. However, there's another type of competition, which is called interference competition. And this is when one species is actively aggressive towards the other. In this case, perhaps lactobacillus may be secreting lactic acid, which would inhibit Gardnerella vaginalis, for example, which we saw in AM1. So first, what we wanted to do was measure the effect of iron on lact lactobacillus species. So in this case, lactobacillus innards and lactobacillus spatus. And then we wanted to determine uh, or investigate potential um, resource competition and also uh, interference competition between lactobacillus crispatus and lactobacillus inners. Um, the results that we're showing today are only for lactobacillus inners, um, but at the end I will tell you the results that we saw for um, lactobacillus gastri. Lactobacillus gastri was chosen not because it was one of the most dominant species, but because it is one of the four uh, most occurrent or prevalent of lactobacillus species in the vaginal microbiome but it was shown to not transition to lactobacillus crispatus, which was interesting. So our hypotheses, uh, we had two. First was that the availability of iron, of free iron, would stimulate the growth of lactobacillus inners. The test for this is to measure the growth of lactobacillus inners and lactobacillus crispatus after they have been supplemented with iron sulfate and with an iron chelator called 2,2-bipyridyl. Second, um, for the results, uh, we, the, additional, the addition of iron did not stimulate growth. However, when we did add the iron chelator, which reduced availability of free iron, we saw that growth was reduced. 
For our second hypothesis, we wanted to investigate the potential uh, for competition between lactobacillus and synthetic laboratory media. And we conduct this um, by doing continuous zero dilution co-culture experiments and also experiments with spent media in synthetic laboratory media. And but the results were that neither resource competition nor interference competition was detected using lab synthetic laboratory media. So these are methods that were used to do the first experiment that we talked about, where iron was added in the form of iron sulfate. Iron chelator was added in the form of 2,2-bipyridyl. We use MNC broth, which supports the growth of lactobacillus inners and L. crispatus, but already includes some amount of iron. And it cannot be, um, if it is removed, then l inners won't be able to grow because serum needs to be added to the media. Also, we incubated them or cultivate them in, 90, in a 96 well microplate. We incubated them anaerobically at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, and we used three different biological replicates. This is a form of picture that shows the reaction where you have an iron, you have iron, and you have 2,2-bipyridyl, and it forms a complex around iron so that it potentially is harder to be able to acquire. And we had a range of 2 bipyridyl between 0 to 1.5 millimolars and then 0 to 100. And in our second experiment, we increased the number of conditions between 0 and 1. And just to remind you, um, MMC is the control where we did not add iron or an iron chelator, but there were still some amounts of iron that were present, which was why we added the chelator to decrease the availability of free iron. These are the methods that show how we were able to conduct our supplemented or, or media in terms of looking at how Eleanor's growth in L. crispata spent media um, is influenced. And so we, had, we grew the cells and removed them, and then we added iron, and we also added MNC powder in order to introduce growth, introduce nutrients back into the medium. We had two different biological replicates of alpha spatis to observe any um, differences between um, strain, or between the, the replicates. And then we had two different technical replicates of each condition and two technical replicates of each control. Now we're seeing the results. So on the left, there's lactobacillus inners, and on the right is L. crispatus. MNC is the control where no iron or chelator was added for both graphs. And as you can see, there was hardly any growth here. And oh, excuse me, the y-axis is the change after 24 hours of optical density or OD. And so at 1.5 millimolars and 1.1, 1 .1, you see that the growth was greatly reduced, but this was not shown for lactobacillus crispatus. When we look at the very right, we see that there was no growth when 100 millimolar of iron was added to both conditions. Now on the left, this, problem, this is because of the 2,2 bipyridyl, which did not have the same effect. And this could be for a few reasons. Uh, perhaps the 2,2 bipyridyl, um, it did form complexes with iron, making it more difficult for lactobacillus inners to acquire iron. Um, however, because L. crispatus did not have the same effect, perhaps it has siderophores that can more efficiently acquire this iron, or maybe lactobacillus crispatus just does not need or require iron. Also, a potential mechanism for the inability for these species of L. inners and L. crispatus um, to grow, or they did not grow, might have been because of a Haber-Weiss reaction, but that is uh, speculated. So in order to look at differences between concentrations of 2,2 bipyridyl and its effect on l inner's growth, uh, we grew lactobacillus inners up to 30 hours and we saw that as you decrease the concentration of 2,2 bipyridyl in, in increments, you also have increased amount of growth, which is an inverse relationship. But you can see that there was indeed a difference and where this is 1.5, 1, 0 0.7, and 0 0.4, we see that 2,2 bipyridyl did have an effect. Also, we wanted to see uh, whether when lactobacillus inners was grown, um, whether there would be a, whether L inners would be able to grow when we added glucose or added, and added iron, and we saw that it was not, it only grew in MNC, which is because, there, there, likely because there were more nutrients that were needed in order to grow these species. Um, in interest of time, I'm going to just say this is a co-culture experiment where a continuous co-culture experiment where serial dilutions took place over time. It was cultured anaerobically, and we used lactobacillus crispatus and L inners. 
As you can see, there are three different conditions. We have a comparable, which is the initial ratio between L winners and crispatus. We have more amounts of lactobacillus crispatus and less amounts of lactobacillus innards for the initial concentration. The vertical purple lines here show the dilutions that took place. And then they were, so the co culture was shown to grow uh, collectively. So this has both species and then it would decrease and then it would increase. So the decrease shows the dilution and the increase shows that they were able to grow. The pH was also monitored. We wanted it to be at seven. And this is shown by the turquoise dot. And when it decreased, it was brought back up to seven at different points. And the composition is also shown where L. crispatus is in the orange and lactobacillus inners is in green. So if there was resource competition, we would have seen that there was an overall trend uh, where one species would have gone a certain direction, but we don't really see that here, no matter what the different conditions were initially. And so we say that we did not detect a difference or resource competition between these species. And the initial uh, seed ratio between cells can be reflected uh, also at time zero when looking at uh, the relative abundance of species. We also wanted to look at the interference competition uh, between both species. And in order to do this, we used, used a similar technique as before, where we, re, we grew cells, removed cells, and then we added back MNC powder. Now, the reason we do this is because if we're testing for interference competition, that would mean that there's molecules that would inhibit the ability for the species to grow. But by adding nutrients, perhaps this inhibiting molecule would still have a negative effect on species. Um, however, we did not see that. Oh, when looking at lactobacillus inners in L inner spent media and lactobacillus inners in L crispata spent media, uh, we can see that the PBS, which is a saline solution, lactobacillus inners did not grow, um, but when we use lactobacillus crispatus spent medium, they also did not tend to grow as much, or they, they basically declined. Uh, but when we look, when we add the nutrients back, they were able to grow. So this would show that there was not really an inhibiting molecule that affected growth or viability of L inners. In the case of Lactobacillus crispatus, um, first we see L. crispatus was able to grow more, that it didn't decrease as much as L. inners, because L. inners is very fastidious. Um, but first, when we did not add any nutrients, there was a great decrease. Um, but when we did add nutrients back, it was able to still survive. So we did not detect interference competition. And so in summary, we were able to show that reduced availability of 2,2 bipyridyl um, did increase 2,2 bipyridyl, reduced the growth of lactobacillus inners, but not of L. crispatus, and that other limiting nutrients uh, probably, there were other limiting nutrients that existed besides glucose and iron, and that um, no interference competition was detected in using synthetic media between L. crispatus and L. inners, and we also saw the same for our second model system with L. gastroi and L. crispatus. So, now, we've used the synthetic laboratory media, uh, but the thing about using synthetic laboratory media is that the components inside of it do not tend to be well-defined, and they tend to be a mixture of different molecules or compounds that do not exist in the vaginal microbiome or in the vagina. And so there were some efforts to make a medium simulating vaginal fluid, where in this case, the glucose competition of that in the glucose concentration of that of vaginal fluid and that of medium simu simulating vaginal fluid are similar um, for different compounds as well. However, for example, there are over 600 more proteins that are present in vaginal fluid that are not present in this simulating, um, simulated vaginal fluid. And so what we wanted to do was to find a way to develop and then implement the use of human vaginal fluid, cervical vaginal fluid, which in this case I will call CBF, and use that to grow lactobacillus species and eventually, in the future, be used to detect interactions. So first we wanted to simulate a vaginal milieu and then exploit the capability of micro droplets that can, that can um, confine small volumes of fluid, specifically because a woman can donate anywhere between 10 microliters to 600 microliters, but in order to do one droplet experiment, we can use 30 microliters for droplets, and droplets work at the at the nanoliter scale or picoliter. So in order to investigate or further start this, this process, we first collected samples, vaginal samples from women. They were self-collected, and we had in total 49 samples that were collected. Then we used a rayon swab 
And this rayon swab, uh, it was not cotton, so we did not, we wanted to avoid uh, sequencing a cotton jeans. So we used rayon. This swab cup is a menstrual cup that is sold over the counter and is used to collect uh, menstrual fluid, but for this case, we collected CVF or CVM. Afterward, we submitted our samples to the Microbial Community Analysis Board, where they did DNA extraction, qPCR, DNA sequencing, and then after the results came back, uh, we processed them using a, a platform or a um, bioinformatic kind of software known as Mother. And afterward, we were able to begin implementing our CVF uh, to culture lactobacillus species. So first, we did submit vaginal swabs instead of CVF, which we used, and literature did show that they were pretty co compatible, but we wanted to demonstrate this. So VS stands for vaginal swab, and CVS is cervical vaginal fluid. And so we see that the microbial composition is similar for subject 48. It was similar for subject 49, similar for subject 50, and similar between uh, subject 51 and 50, 51. And so this demonstrates that we can indeed, or, or verifies that we can use vaginal sample swabs instead of CBF for sequencing. And this represents uh, the microbial composition of all of the samples that we have received. Uh, most of them are Lactobacillus crispatus, as you can see, and because of this, we chose Lactobacillus crispatus as the species in order to pool our vaginal fluid. Um, because most women who were dominated by L. Cris who had high prevalences of L. crispatus, um, this would help us increase our, our volume. In order to normalize for the volume between different women, um, because different women can, can donate and have volumes of 10 microliters to 600 microliters, we added the same volume for each person. So we included, we aliquoted amounts of 40 microliters from each woman in order to have a pool. And this pool was composed of women who were mostly colonized by Lactobacillus crispatus. Um, then we cultured the bacteria in micro droplets. So Lactobacillus enters, known to be quite fastidious, hard to grow. Uh, we cultured this and we used two different pH values for L, L enters. It tends to prefer pH 7, but the natural environment tends to be 4. L crispatus, we grew this at pH 4, which is the preferred pH for L crispatus and preferred for L gastri. And then we had empty droplets to make sure there was no contamination. We grew them anaerobically and in micro droplets. So this shows Lactobacillus crispatus at zero hours and 24 hours at, with fluorescence overlay and at bright fields. And we saw that they did not grow, which was very surprising because it was L crispatus dominated vaginal fluid. And we think reasons for this may have been because there was not enough nutrients um, in the vaginal fluid for the, the CVF for them to grow. And this also could have been that perhaps there are some molecules compounds from the host or signaling molecules that are produced from that host constitutively that would allow them to grow. But because we have removed them from their natural environment, they no longer would be able to receive these molecules, potential molecules. But in the case of Lactobacillus enters, a very fastidious, hard to grow organism that does not even grow in MRS, which is used to grow all, most of the Lactobacillus, it was actually discovered in 1999, way after Lactobacillus, we found that it did grow. And Lactobacillus crispatus dominated um, CVF. But it grew only at pH 7 and not so much at pH 4. And pH 7 was chosen for LNOs because it was more preferred. And so this was very surprising. Uh, but when we actually pulled them together, we see that the pH tended to have a specific effect on L inners, where the pH 4 is shown here, and pH 4 of L inners is in blue. And so we can see initially at time zero that there was a drop for L inners at pH 4. But while L crispatus and gas while were at pH 4, they had a viability that was much higher than that of L inners. And after 12 hours, L inners at pH 4, the colonies were no longer detectable. But L inners at pH 7 almost reached what was higher than 1 times 10 to the 9 colony forming cells per unit. Colony forming units per colony forming units. And then for Lactobacillus crispatus, which is purple, um, they were able to survive and then L gasteri decreased within 24 hours. So in summary, we were able to demonstrate or show that Lactobacillus inners was able to grow in LC dominated CVF. And we also developed media to simulate the vaginal milieu um, using pooled LC-dominated um, CVS. And then we adopted our microfluidic uh, platform to confine small volumes, in this case, CVF. In conclusion, we have demonstrated the effectiveness, effectiveness of microdroplets using our 
platform or model system between Elgensenia and Gardnerella and Lactobacillus gensenia and Enterococcus faecalis. We have also detected no interaction between the Lactobacillus species, um, L. enters and L. crispatus and L. crispatus and L. gastri. And we showed that the addition of 2 2 biparital did reduce the growth of L. enters, but not of L. crispatus. And also, we were able to develop and implement media that mimic the valid genome milieu um, and also showed that when adopting micro droplets, we were able to confine uh, CVF in order to culture bacteria. A future work involves a use of this fluorescent species or fluorescent strain of L. crispatus. Uh, fluorescence increases the capability where we can now use fluorescent automated cell sorting to do more high throughput automatic screens. And also, it was not mentioned in this work, but the, where the location of sampling also will affect microbial composition. Lactobacillus enters is actually the most widely detected bacterium, but was not the most widely detected here, and that might have been because of ethnicity or demographics. And so changing location can also select for different species, and if we were to grow um, bacteria in Lactobacillus enters dominated uh, fluid, perhaps L. crispatus would grow. And in order to do interactions, you would need both species to grow. So with that, I would like to thank, so a sincere thank you for everyone who has helped me along this journey. I'm just answering, trying to answer and answering these questions. I'd like to thank Professor Lynn. You have been a tremendous help for me and you have helped me so much in terms of growing and being so, in your support. Um, I, this was truly a transformative experience for me and you, I will remember you forever. And Professor Forney, I wanna thank you for your support. Um, Although you are at the University of Idaho, you have definitely helped me to grow, um, especially in terms of the way I think and, and writing and presenting also. Uh, Betsy, uh, Professor Foxman, I wanna thank you so much because there are so many other directions that we could have gone in, but with your experience and with your expertise, you have been able to guide us, in especially when working with um, human samples. And uh, Professor Gulari, you have also been a tremendous support for me. I want to thank you for all of your advice that you've given me throughout these six years. Um, you've been very helpful. And Dean Solomon, I want to also thank you. Um, some of your questions and your contributions have helped me to be able to think uh, differently and, and more of high level in order to think about what direction we're taking. Um, all of my lab members, our work is different. No one else works on the vaginal microbiome, but you guys have been very attentive and you've asked questions that have helped me along the way so much. So I wanna thank you all for your individual contributions and your attentiveness. And some members are not here, but I also thank them. Um, there, this University of Michigan is really big, but we have been able to, fa to find different people who have helped us. Um, our CBS underwent um, mass spectroscopy analysis, and that was due to the help of the chemistry department with Robert, Professor Robert Kennedy and his student, Matt Sorensen. Uh, I, I learned how to culture anaerobic bacteria in the Tom Smith lab and took Vincent Young's class on learning how about microbial interactions, so I wanna thank them for their help and support. Uh, Jason Bell, there's something that was not included in this dissertation, but we had, I actually went to the hospital to start collecting samples there. And we, we filled out an entire IRB through the medical school, and he opened up his team to us so that, or to me, so while I was there so that I worked with them and they helped me to collect even more samples for a completely different, a different study. And also the University of Idaho, um, Professor Lynn would allow me to go to the Forney lab who was on the call, he's the committee member, in order to learn how to culture lactobacillus species and just learn more about their environment. And what I found and learned, the people I met was were truly instrumental for my journey. And I remember these people and they have helped me so much, even with sending me strains and just advice along the way. And Kaneta is still in the lab and I talk to her now. So she, she's, they're all very helpful. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my funding sources and thank everyone for being here, and thank you so much. It had had uh, bacteria vaginosis in the past, so were there any criteria that you were looking for or that any criteria you were trying to exclude? Yes, absolutely. So not only in the hospital, but also when we collected samples here, there, were, there was definitely criteria that actually, I think, excluded quite a number of people. Um, first, the women had to be of reproductive age, which for our purpose was between ages 21. It could be lower, but it was 21 to 45. And it was open to students, faculty, and staff, but students were the people who donated. And um, they had to be healthy, meaning that they couldn't have had a 
but I don't want to go into detail, uh, but they had to be healthy. Um, they initially could not be on birth control because hormonal birth control is known to affect um, the vaginal microbiota, but Jason Bell has work that um, suggests that it does not have an effect, so I think that's something that could use some further discussion and just thought or, or some time to, to talk and discuss about. Um, let's see. Yes, there were there was a lot of criteria. I think I have a slide on it, but um, I, yes, it's there was quite a, a bit of criteria. There are some questions that interest me particularly. Um, for example, um, people have seen that there are differences in terms of diversity among ethnic groups, and also in terms of using micro droplets, which I think is a tremendous tool that can be used. I think that doing more experiments to collect different samples and if we collect the ones that are enable growth, because um, there is also some, there can be some technicality with that because we want to make sure the results are, re are reproducible. But at least seeing if we can actually kind of develop a more, I guess a pipeline that has, that is able to grow more than one species and then look at interactions between them. I mean, that's very close to what I've done, so I don't know, we'd have to talk about what I can, would be able to do. Um, but also, like it would be great. A lot of people in the lab use of they have fluorescence in their cells, so that that wasn't. We unfortunately we weren't able to really do um, high throughput screening in terms of like using facts. Uh, but if we were able to use this this strain, there's a lot more um, experiments we could have done. For example, also there was what we were planning to do was co-culture Lactobacillus crispatus um, with like natural microbial subsets from women with BV and then women with without, just to see what effects that would have had. But yes, and I, and I do plan to think more about the future, too. We have a question back here. We have a question. Hi, um, Corinne? Um, great job, um, especially for those of us who are not as to what you were doing. Um, on the physical side, then, uh, can you let us know like, what the level of significance was? Was it bona fide and what types? Um, analysis uh, tools that you use on it, and which depends on its distribution. And also, uh, so I don't know if it's an ANOVA statistical analysis. So initially for the AIM-1, we, we had a lot of um, statistics. Uh, we used the t-test, and specifically for the flasks, I believe that was definitely less than 0 0.0001. Um, but when we used qPCR in that one point when there was, there were two asterisks, that was closer to uh, zero point equal, the P was the probability was equal to 0 0.006, closer to that. Um, the results are really more new for AIM-2, so I would have to look back into the results to see the exact numbers for um, the iron, where there's also statistical significance. Um, but I know that when there are three stars and not four, that would mean that the value was greater than 0 0.0001. So I'm supposed to introduce myself, you said. So I'm Corrine's uh, tall but slightly dim-witted uncle. Uh, this was a lot for me to take in. I'm probably still back on like slide five or something. But the question I have is, so in the aim three and what you were talking about uh, toward the very last part of the briefing, you were talking about glucose and iron in the environment, right? And what I'm trying to, to grasp is you pick iron or you pick glucose because it's going to be a, a nutrient for these particular organisms. But you picked iron because iron is present during Menzies and you wanted to see, was that the most dynamic environment to see these particular organisms do what they do in? Or was there another particular um, molecule that you could actually pick in order to see what you needed to see. So in other words, I know that glucose was a nutrient, but I'm having trouble figuring out or understanding uh, the role that iron particularly played in it. Right, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so from this pathway, you can see that both species are able to metabolize glucose, they can see at the top. And glucose uh, is a carbon source. All species would need a carbon source. And sometimes when we did some of the spent medium experiments, 
um, sometimes glucose could be depleted and it wouldn't be there. So in order to kind of negate that as a possibility for no growth, we just went ahead and added glucose, um, even for AIM-3. Um, but in the case of iron, I'm glad you asked that because it could be um, explained more. Um, now I'm going to make an observation of this one graph, but just please note that this does not apply to every woman. It is only in this case, and I did choose this because it demonstrates what a, a point that I wanted to make, but it is not the same for every woman. But if you are to look at this graph, you'll see that every, every time that there's a spike, this is when a woman had her menstrual cycle. And when you have a menstrual cycle, there is an increase in, in iron. And so this, again, was not similar. I don't want to cherry pick, <laughs> but... But there have been other scientists, other researchers have shown that when there is increase in blood or, or is a, an iron containing source, that iron tends to thrive. Another interesting study, it wasn't published, but it was written about, um, showed that lactobacillus enters did grow in MRS, which it doesn't grow without the addition of blood. And it was when one to, I think it was one to 10%, uh, human blood was added and one to ten of sheep blood was added and then but however when they just added um, iron by themselves they didn't see that grow so a lot of people do say that iron a source of iron could potentially grow also with the serum and when you add serum it contains iron among other things but I mean, what is it that makes them grow we don't really know so that was kind of why I added iron just as a hypothesis maybe it could help it grow but and another thing is that MNC media, can, because it contains a serum, which has some traces of iron, enough for it to grow, um, we weren't able to remove it. And so we chose iron because it was easier to work with. Uh, we couldn't, we didn't have a chelator for a carbon source, so that's why we, we would have chosen a carbon source. And I believe um, Kaneda and Larry's and Professor Forney's lab tried to do a competition experiment with a carbon source. But for this, for our purposes, we chose iron because um, because we were able to change the availability of it. Right, and it was, it was present during Menzies, like your spike show, and so... Yeah, so, so in our experiment, um, it was basically using synthetic laboratory media, but this is an example of what happened. This is a different study, but it was, this happened um, within the woman. This, this represents her microbiome. Thank you. You're welcome. One more, Scott. I have kind of a related question, maybe. So I thought it was really interesting that the two different species, one grew in uh, CBF, the other one didn't at all. Mm -hmm. And he speculated that you know, maybe there was something missing in the nutrients from there. I'm wondering um, if you have any ideas on like, what might be the thing missing? And also, is it possible that there's something like inhibitory that comes from the fluid itself? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that, Scott. So the first question, was, wait, remind me the first one again? Just with one word, oh, keyword. Yeah, what do you, you know what nutrients might be eliminated? Right, right, so mucin. Mucin is in cervical vaginal mucus, uh, but that was, that's what species are known to bind to, adhere to, and some species can metabolize it, I believe, like l inners can or l crispatus can, and that was removed. So um, that could have been one, one nutrient that was not there, uh, specifically. And then your second question, Yeah, so I would say I don't I don't think that there's anything that was toxic because, well, maybe it's pH dependent. But from this graph, um, L. crispatus didn't didn't uh, the, if it was toxic, it would have decreased, and that is what happened for alanines at pH four. But when the pH was at seven, it didn't decrease. So I, I don't think I think that the results did show that we didn't really see and and interference because l inners was able to grow in l crispatus dominated CBS, and I think that that shows that there were no molecules present or active that were able to inhibit l inners. Well, I have to say that this is one of the most uh, intensive audience I've had <laughs> <laughs> about all the defenses that I've, I've experienced. So um, I'm sure you have more questions, but for the purpose of uh, this process, we actually do have to get you guys out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll, we'll continue this, uh, this defense process. But thanks everyone for coming.